So I'm here with uh, David Donohoe, who has been awarded the Gauss Prize for his contributions to signal processing. Um, now, how do you feel having won the prize? When the IMU president first contacted me about this, I felt a great deal of responsibility because I know the previous winners of this prize are giants. Kiyosi Ito, Yves Meyer, Stan Osher. It's very hard for me personally to feel that I measure up to them and I feel that they set a fantastic standard personally and in, in some ways I feel I'm not the mathematician that I could be probably because I've spent a lot of time working on applications and in industry so uh, there's certain ways that maybe I'm not the greatest mathematician and not worth celebrating on my own. However, I think I have a nice message to present here and I think it will be very useful for people at the International Congress of Mathematicians to hear it. It's about an important application area and a kind of a triumph for mathematics. So despite my personal shortcomings, I think it will be a good occasion. I'm sure that it will be. Um, now let's start with the sort of outcome of, of your research, uh, which involves imaging techniques such as MRI scanning. And um, this, the mathematics you've worked on has helped re revolutionize that. Could you explain in what sense and how it's revolutionized MRI, for example? Well, in the last year, the three major medical device manufacturers, uh, GE, Siemens, and Philips have all put on the market new MRI scanners. These advertise from 8x to 16x speed ups in various applications. Uh, those speed ups mean that patients don't have to spend nearly as much time in the scanner. And of course, anyone who's been in the scanner realizes you're sitting tightly confined in a tube that's making clanging noises and that is very claustrophobia inducing and extremely, um, uh, let's say, boring and other, other things. But you, you might not have thought about the following. There are some patients who are extremely sick and for whom this is more than just a boring experience, but it's actually almost a torture. Um, there are individuals who have cardiac problems that are being asked to hold their breath a long time and they can barely do it. And there's children who can't sit still long enough and so they have to be irradiated with x-rays instead of uh, MRI image. And there's a variety of problems that are caused by the lengthy exposure times that MRI traditionally required. The speed ups ought to mean in practice that children are better served and a number of different uh, kinds of illnesses will be much better served. So that's, that's important and it, it ought to also mean that we all get better medical care for less money because time is money and so it, anything that we can do to speed up will mean that more people can be served on the same equipment in less time and it ought to mean that the cost can be spread across more different users. It, it ought to mean many improvements will come over time and in practice we are seeing those improvements. Well that's quite some impact for your mathematics to have so let's go Back to the mathematics. Um, your work involved what are called sparse signals. Could you give us a sense of what is meant by that and also how you first came across them? So after college I went to work in the oil exploration business for a few years uh, basically to pay back my father. American universities are private arrangements and families pay for their children often. Uh, my brother and sister needed to go to college and they were younger than me and so I lived at home and signed over my paychecks in my first adult job. 
Uh, it, but it was great for me because I was working in oil exploration and it was the advent of digital uh, processing of seismic signals. And during that experience, I learned that there were many interesting features of signal processing that did not yet have good mathematical explanations, but that were quite interesting. And one of those was that apparently you could blindly deconvolve an image. So some image could be corrupted by blurring and even though you didn't know what the corruption was, you could undo it. And that just really captured my imagination. And it seemed empirically at the time that this was associated in some way with a special feature of seismic signals, which was sparsity. Yeah, a sparse signal is something that's zero a lot of the time and then occasionally non-zero. And there are many such sparse signals around us, but we may not have spent much time thinking about their sparsity. It is, however, a fundamental ingredient of the signals world, and I was exposed to it through that uh, initial job. People who know a little bit about signal processing might have heard about something called Fourier analysis, which is about taking a signal and decomposing it into known uh, components. But there's also something called wavelets. Um, could you tell us what wavelets are, roughly speaking, and how they link into what you've been doing? So, wavelet analysis is a way of breaking up information into contributions from various scales. So scientists often want to say that the time scale of a certain phenomenon is two seconds and they, by that they mean you know something is happening maybe between a second or two seconds that that you you can observe and and so they need a language about the scale on which things happen and from field to field the time scale of course might not be a second it might be a microsecond in some other field or it might be a million years in another field but scientists need to refer to scale in time and to the idea that there could be a whole range of scales on which things happen and that maybe scientific description requires multiple scale descriptions. Wavelets came along in the 1980s as developed by mathematicians and engineers as, as a way to articulate the notion of scales very precisely and create tools to automatically extract and represent the information that's available at various time scales. Um, it wasn't only used for things happening in time. It could also be used in images. It could also be used in, in 3D data and so on. What's the importance of wavelets in the sparsity story? So humans have a visual system which is very important to who we are as a species. It, our ability to see allows us to identify each other. That turns us into a social animal. It allows us to communicate through writing and to communicate visually through all the wonderful new media that we've created. Um, Our visual cortex, however, if you actually look at our neural processing equipment, has very limited capacity. It's very uh, energy intensive, and the brain uses up a bit large fraction of the energy that we consume, and yet it has a very limited information rate. So that the only way that the biological equipment we have could possibly work is for what we look at to have in some way a simplicity to it. 
if we were looking at very arbitrary visual information, probably it would overwhelm our brains and we wouldn't be able to understand it. But actually, when I'm looking out towards you and towards this convention center, I see simplicity. I see large swaths of space that are almost the same. And I see specific objects occupying that space in specific locations. That underlying simplicity is made very plain by the wavelet transform. And in fact, it's been understood really for decades that the uh, human visual cortex does a kind of wavelet transform itself and that it's actually revealing to the brain the simplicity of the visual scenes exactly by the same strategy that mathematicians have found useful in developing their mathematical wavelets. So all the work um, developed into something that is called compressed sensing. Could you please explain what, 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 it, what that is? Well, the basic idea is that because the world is simpler than it seems, many images are compressible, and particularly the things that humans can interpret. In some sense, if it's, a, if it's an image that humans can work with, it's not as complicated as we might at first think. If that's true, then a very interesting thing must also be true. We don't really need to gather all the data that we're used to gathering in order to construct an image. So, in a magnetic resonance image, you might imagine that because there's a million pixels, you must make a million measurements in order to construct an image. But suppose that hiding behind that million pixel image is the simplicity that there's only a thousand genuine objects and their boundaries. Maybe you don't need a million measurements. Maybe you only need 10,000. And as long as you understand that as a slogan, you're on, on the route to understanding part of the compressed sensing story. Uh, another part of the story is that, of course, the measurements that you might have to take might be very mathematically specific if you want to make those reduced measurements. Simply making measurements uh, of, of an arbitrary nature without any planning or thought, that probably wouldn't work. But maybe if you use some mathematical ideation, you might come up with a way that, yes, indeed, with fewer measurements, you could get by. So some mathematicians in the mid-2000s started to look at it the following way. What if we make random measurements? Now, that would seem really crazy, but the thing is, Mathematicians know a lot about random measurements, and they have wonderful tools from advanced mathematics for understanding the properties of random measurements. So, Emmanuel Condes and Terry Tao, for example, began a program of understanding what might happen if you use random measurements, and they developed using the theory of random matrices and other tools from advanced probability theory, what the properties of random measurement schemes could be. And then I became involved and also studied random measurements. And what started to emerge from this study is that random measurements already are good enough to save you a tremendous number of measurements so that maybe you really only need 10,000 measurements on a 
million pixel image. If they're random, and they're just picking up random pieces out of the image all over the place, that might be already enough. Great. Well, congratulations again on your prize. Well, thank you, and uh, I would like to just say that the prize should be something that in, in, is something that reminds us that math has applications, and that it's actually specifically intended by the International Mathematical Union to recognize the broad range of applications that math has. In the uh, Fields Medal press conference, I did mention the point that many times math can be very pure and seem to have no applications but it may turn out over time that we learn of spectacular applications. So everyone out there should keep that in mind next time they have an MRI or in many other things that they may be doing with digital media. I'm sure we will. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome.